The sooner people realize this about the Antichrist, the better. Today, we are going to explore a plausible scenario of end-time events, grounded in Scripture. Please note that this is just one possible interpretation and not a definitive prediction. Our foundation will be the Bible, and will examine a coherent and logical sequence of events that align with Christian eschatology. To begin, let's turn to a crucial eschatological passage, the Olivet Discourse found in Matthew 24. This sermon, delivered by Jesus on the Mount of Olives, offers valuable insights into the end times. The Mount of Olives, overlooking Jerusalem, provides a fitting backdrop for this pivotal message. Let's dive into the scripture and explore this scenario together. As we delve into Matthew 24, we're engaging with a passage that resonates profoundly with our contemporary world. This chapter serves as a pivotal cornerstone of eschatology, offering valuable insights into the era we're living in and the imminent return of Christ. We're reminded that we're living in the end times and the clock is ticking. The book of Revelation draws near. In this passage, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ provides a detailed and enlightening discourse on the events and signs that will mark the end of days. Jesus' teachings here are not only prophetic but also instructive and cautionary. His warnings are unparalleled in their urgency and gravity, setting him apart from other biblical writers. As we explore this chapter, Let's heed Jesus' words and gain a deeper understanding of the times we're living in. As I preach this message, I want you to focus on the word of Christ. Take this warning from Christ so seriously, for this warning from Christ could be the very thing, the warning that saves you from deception and eternity in the lake of fire. Jesus in Matthew 24 speaks of widespread deception, for the end of days will be an age of deception, the likes of which the world has never seen. Matthew 24, 3, 5. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed, that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. The purpose of this sermon is to focus on the fifth verse of this chapter, which states Matthew 24, 5. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. To explore Matthew 24, 5 in its original language, which is Greek, we need to look at the specific phrase used for, I am the Christ. The key phrase here, I am the Christ, is pronounced, ego eimi ho Christos. The term Christos is derived from the Greek verb krio, meaning to anoint. In Jewish tradition, anointing with oil was a sign of being set apart by God for a special purpose, such as kings, priests, and prophets. Therefore, Christos came to be understood as the anointed one, a title that in Jewish expectation referred to a promised deliverer or Messiah. In the context of Matthew 24, 5, the phrase, Ego Amy Ho Christos, in English, I am the Christ, signifies individuals falsely claiming to be the anointed saviour or messianic figure foretold in Jewish scriptures. Jesus warns that many will come claiming this title to deceive people, thus emphasising the need for discernment among his followers. Now, with this backdrop in mind, it is time for us to travel to the book of Revelation and introduce the second beast. In Revelation chapter 13, the first beast is the beast that comes out of the sea, the Antichrist. But he is not our focus today. We are looking at the second beast, the one who comes to endorse the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 13 verses 11 to 14, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword, and did live. It is plausible that the second beast, who is commonly referred to as the false prophet, could be an individual who arrives on the world scene and states the phrase we see in Matthew 24 to 5, stating, I am the Christ. And as a result, many will be deceived. Listen to the choice of words. It is plausible, and several theologians believe that the false prophet will be an individual who will come claiming to be Christ, Jesus himself. Now, allow me to set the stage for you in Revelation chapter 13. If this plausible scenario does indeed take place, Think for a moment how convincing this will be to the world and to quote-unquote Christians. Imagine if this false prophet claims to be Christ, 
as we are told in Matthew 24, 5, that many will come claiming to be Christ. Think just how convincing this will be to the world population. Continuing from this point, the potency of the false prophet's deception lies not only in his claim, but also in the wonders he will perform. Revelation 13 details the miraculous signs that this second beast, the false prophet, will execute. These signs are not mere tricks. They are supernatural in nature, designed to give validity to the false prophet. For instance, the ability to make fire come down from heaven is a direct mimicry of the prophetic power demonstrated by Elijah in the Old Testament. To the unsuspecting world, these miracles will serve as proof of his divine authority, making his claim to be the Christ seem credible. Think for a moment, just think, how convincing this will be to the world, to the sheer number of so-called Christians who would be convinced that this false prophet is the Christ if the Christ if they saw him bring fire from heaven. The compelling nature of these miracles cannot be understated. In a world seeking signs and wonders, the ability to perform such feats will captivate many. Even Christians, especially those who are not rooted in scripture, will follow these signs and wonders. The sight of fire from heaven, among other miracles, will be a powerful tool in the hands of the false prophet to seduce even those who may be skeptical. Remember, the human heart longs for the miraculous, and in the absence of discernment, it can easily be led astray by spectacular displays of power. Continuing further, the narrative of the Exodus provides a crucial lesson in discerning the source of miracles. When Aaron, under God's command, performed miraculous signs in Egypt, the magicians of Pharaoh were able to replicate some of these wonders. This episode starkly illustrates that miraculous feats in themselves are not definitive proof that someone is of the Lord God Almighty. Just as the Egyptian magicians were able to mimic Aaron's miracles to a degree, the false prophet, empowered by demonic forces, will perform signs that mimic those associated with divine power. Moreover, another convincing element will be the false prophet's ability to speak persuasively, as indicated by his speaking like a dragon. His words will be seductive and compelling, offering a false sense of hope and peace. In a world riddled with chaos and uncertainty, the eloquence and assurance in his speech will draw many to believe in his false message of salvation. Theologically speaking, this scenario raises serious implications about the need for discernment in the last days. If this plausible scenario does take place, Christians who are deceived by this false prophet will have no leg to stand on. For Christ himself in Matthew 24 warned us that there will be people in the last days who come and claim, I am Christ. Believers must be grounded in the truth of Scripture and the teachings of Christ to resist such deception. And it underscores the importance of understanding the nature of true Christ-like miracles, which are not just about power, but about pointing people towards repentance and the kingdom of God. However, this false prophet's miracles will point people to the Antichrist and the mark of the beast. Now back to the 24th chapter in the book of Matthew. See 18 verses later from Matthew 2.4.5, we read, Matthew 2.4.24, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Could it be that Jesus is warning us about the pivotal figure that will rise in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation? Could it be that Jesus is warning us about this second beast? Could it be that this second beast will attempt to claim to be Christ himself? Could it be that as a direct result of this claim from this second beast, even the very elect will be deceived into believing he is Christ? Could it be that this false prophet in Revelation 13 will deceive the world into believing that he is Jesus Christ? Now think of these modern-day Christian churches, these modern-day churches that attempt to change and move with the world. These modern-day Christian churches do not view the Holy Bible as God's final and only message. Think of these churches that attempt to discount the pivotal role of the Bible in the lives of Christians. Don't you think that if indeed this plausible scenario takes shape, they will listen to this false prophet and listen to him as he guides the world into the worship of the Antichrist and the acceptance of the mark of the beast? Matthew 24, 24 for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. The warning is significant because it underscores the level of deception that will be prevalent in the end times. The mention of false Christs suggests individuals who will claim messianic authority or divine status, attempting to replicate or usurp the role and identity of Jesus Christ. Imagine if this second beast comes and claims to be Christ. There will be Christians, and I use the label Christians lightly in this context, who will be deceived into believing, do not follow me, although I am the Christ. Follow this man instead. 
this man being the Antichrist. I am led to believe that here in Matthew 24, 24, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is referring to the second beast because of the phrase, to perform great signs and wonders. The phrase, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect, implies that this deception will be so sophisticated and compelling that even the most faithful and discerning believers could be at risk of being misled. John 8, 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and a bold not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. The Bible describes Satan as the father of lies. What a title to give an individual, father of lies. Deception itself flows from him. This title is not just a mere label. It encapsulates the very essence of his being and actions. When scripture assigns such a title to an individual, it is meant to convey a deep and intrinsic truth about that entity's nature. In the case of Satan, being called the father of lies signifies that he is the originator, the source from which deception springs forth, and I believe that we as Christians grossly, irresponsibly and foolishly underestimate Lucifer as the father of lies, the great deceiver. And I cannot think of a better way for that serpent, Lucifer the fallen one, to deceive the world into accepting his mark, ushering the world into worshipping the Antichrist, except through a false prophet who claims to be Christ himself, doing and performing in front of the eyes of many, but miracles of quite literal biblical proportions, pointing people to not follow him but rather to follow the Antichrist. Because by doing this he would indirectly disprove the truth of the gospel to people without discernment, the father of lies. This title, as mentioned in John 8, 44, where Jesus explicitly states that there is no truth in Satan, and that lying is his native language, reveals the depth of his deceit. It implies that every action and every word from Satan is steeped in falsehood, designed to mislead, corrupt and destroy. His lies are not just simple untruths, they are crafted to lead people away from God's truth, to distort their perception of reality and to ensnare them in spiritual bondage, in considering this, it becomes clear that we as Christians may often underestimate the extent of Satan's capacity for deception. We might think of lies in human terms, small untruths or occasional falsehoods, but for Satan, lying is his very nature. He is the architect of deception and his influence extends far beyond mere individual lies. His deceptions have shaped cultures, societies and histories. They are woven into the fabric of fallen humanity. Furthermore, the title Father of Lies underscores the contrast between Satan and God, who is described as truth itself, John 14.6. While God reveals, liberates and brings light, Satan conceals, enslaves and brings darkness through his lies. This stark contrast is at the heart of the spiritual battle that rages in the world, and this is the worst thing about deception. The worst thing about deception is that people do not even know they are being deceived. Although our topic today is a plausible scenario of how the end of days will unfold, it is plausible that the second beast could arrive on this earth, claiming to be Christ himself. I cannot state this is how it will unfold, because there are also other plausible scenarios of how the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation will unfold. Therefore, I do not have the authority to state 100% that this is how it will unfold. However, the authority that I do know for sure, that I can state with 100% confidence, is that in the last days, particularly the time of the rise of the first and second beasts, will be an age and time of deception like no other. It will be nothing of the sort that we have ever seen. The sooner people realize this about the age of the Antichrist, the better. It is an age of deception. It is a period of great deception. And even though the Antichrist himself and the false prophet have not arrived in 2023, and even if they do not arrive in 2024, or for decades to come, we know that the Antichrist spirit is working today already and deceiving the hearts of many. There is only one thing, and one thing only, that will protect you from deception. The Bible. This is why the Bible is the most important and treasured thing on this earth for a believer. Do not trust in men. Trust in the Bible. Do not trust in nations. Trust in the Bible. Do not trust in religions. Trust in the Bible. Trust in the Bible. Trust in the unchanging Word of God. This Holy Bible has something to say about everything that will unfold in this world. When the false prophet and the Antichrist arrive, which they will, this Bible will point them out as clear as day. Moving away from the Bible leaves you open to deception. This Bible rises head and shoulders above all of your experiences, thoughts and ideas. If things begin to happen in this world that you cannot understand, don't go to a podcast, don't go to a video, go to the Bible. 
If you are confused and lost, go to the Bible. If you are confused about taking a mark, go to the Bible. If false prophets and false Christs are claiming to be Jesus Christ and are attempting to lead you astray and you are confused, go to the Bible. If signs and wonders are confusing you, go to the Bible. The holy book is God's holy word. It will not lead you astray.